All right, team, let's roll up our sleeves and dig into something fundamental yet fascinating, capital structure and the cost of capital. Now, I know this sounds like a mouthful, but trust me, by the end of this session, you'll see how these concepts are the backbone of finance. Whether you're managing a Fortune 500 company or analyzing a small business, understanding how to balance debt and equity will give you the edge. So let's get into it, step by step, with some real world flavor. Capital structure, the backbone of corporate finance. So what's capital structure all about? Imagine you're running a business. You need money to get things going, buying inventory, paying salaries, expanding operations, and so on. This money can come from two main sources, debt and equity. Debt, this is like borrowing money from the bank. It's cheaper, especially when interest rates are low, but it comes with strings attached. You've got to pay it back with interest. And if you take on too much, you could end up in a tight spot. Think of debt as the fuel that can power your car. But if you're not careful, it can also blow up your engine. Equity. This is where you sell a piece of your company to investors. Equity is more expensive because investors expect a higher return. They're taking on more risk since they get paid after all debts are settled. But equity is also flexible. It doesn't have to be repaid like debt. It's like getting a boost from a push start when your car battery dies. No immediate repayment needed, but it's not a free ride. The mix of these two, debt and equity, forms your capital structure. The goal? Find the perfect blend that minimizes your weighted average cost of capital, WAC, and maximizes your company's value. Now, let's talk about cost of capital. This is the minimum return a company must earn on its investments to satisfy its investors. If you don't meet this threshold, you're essentially destroying value, which is a big no-no in finance. WAC is the average cost of debt and equity weighted by their proportions in the company's capital structure. Here's the formula you'll need to know. So why is WAC so crucial? Because it's like the company's hurdle rate the minimum return it needs to achieve on any investment or project to make it worthwhile. If your WAC is too high, you'll need to earn a lot just to break even. If it's low, you've got more room to generate value for your shareholders. Consider Apple Incorporation. When they decide to launch a new product, they use their WAC to evaluate whether the expected returns from that product will exceed the cost of capital. If the return is higher, they go ahead. If not, they might shelve the project. Next up, let's dive into the factors that influence a company's capital structure. These are the building blocks that will help you understand why companies choose different mixes of debt and equity. Business model characteristics. The nature of a company's business determines how much debt it can safely take on. Companies with stable, recurring revenues, like utilities, can afford more debt because their cash flows are predictable. On the flip side, companies with volatile revenues, like tech startups, need to be cautious with debt because their income streams are uncertain. Think about Netflix. Its subscription-based model provides stable and predictable revenue, allowing it to take on substantial debt to finance new content. Compare that with a startup like Snapchat, which might struggle with revenue volatility and therefore might rely more on equity. Existing leverage. A company already loaded with debt might find it challenging to borrow more without increasing the risk of financial distress. Investors will start to worry if they see too much debt on the balance sheet. It's like seeing someone maxing out their credit cards. Corporate tax rate. Debt is often preferred because the interest payments are tax deductible. This means the higher the tax rate, the cheaper debt becomes, which is a significant consideration when choosing between debt and equity. U.S. companies often take advantage of this tax benefit. Before the 2017 tax reforms, many firms loaded up on debt 
to maximize tax shields, effectively reducing their tax bills. Company life cycle stage. The stage of a company's life also plays a massive role. Startups often can't afford much debt because they don't have the steady cash flow to service it. Mature companies, on the other hand, can use more debt because they have stable revenues and strong market positions. Consider Tesla in its early days. It was heavily reliant on equity financing because its cash flows were uncertain. As it matured and became profitable, it started to take on more debt to finance expansion, knowing it could handle the interest payments. Now let's talk about external factors. Market conditions. The state of the financial markets plays a big role. If interest rates are low, debt becomes more attractive because borrowing is cheap. During economic booms, companies might leverage up to take advantage of growth opportunities. During the low interest rate environment post-2008 financial crisis, many companies took on cheap debt to finance buybacks, mergers, and expansions. This led to a significant increase in corporate leverage. Regulatory constraints. Some industries are more heavily regulated and these regulations can limit the amount of debt a company can safely use. For instance, banks are required to maintain certain capital ratios to ensure stability. The banking sector is a prime example. Regulators like the Federal Reserve require banks to hold a minimum amount of capital, which restricts how much they can leverage. Industry norms. Companies often look at their peers when deciding their capital structure. If everyone in your industry is using a certain level of debt, you might feel pressure to do the same to stay competitive. For example, in the airline industry, companies typically operate with high leverage because aircraft can be financed through debt. However, the cyclicality of the industry also means that companies must be cautious about over leveraging. Let's walk through how capital structure evolves as a company moves from a startup to a mature business. Startups. In the early days, startups are often cash consumers, burning through money to build their products and market themselves. With little to no revenue, these companies rely heavily on equity financing because debt is either unavailable or prohibitively expensive. Uber, during its early years, relied heavily on venture capital and equity financing to fuel its rapid expansion, with little debt in the mix due to its uncertain revenue streams and high cash burn rate. Growth Phase As the company starts to grow, revenues pick up and cash flows become more predictable. This phase sees companies still relying on equity, but they can now start to use debt as well. Lenders become more comfortable because the company has proven its ability to generate cash. For example, Amazon, during its growth phase, began using debt to finance infrastructure like warehouses and data centers as its revenue streams became more predictable and stable. Maturity. In the mature stage, the company is generating consistent positive cash flows and the business risk has significantly decreased. This is when debt becomes a major component of the capital structure because it's cheaper than equity. However, many mature companies still maintain a balance to avoid the risks associated with high leverage. Coca-Cola is a classic example of a mature company. It uses significant debt in its capital structure because it has stable cash flows and low business risk, which allows it to benefit from the tax shield on debt. Unique situations. Some businesses don't follow the typical life cycle pattern. For instance, capital intensive businesses with tangible assets like airlines or utilities might use high levels of debt at various stages because their assets can serve as collateral. On the other hand, capital light businesses like software companies might avoid debt altogether 
relying on internally generated cash flows to fund operations. Southwest Airlines operates with high leverage, secured by its fleet of aircraft, while a company like Adobe, with its software as a service model, operates with very little debt due to its strong cash flows and minimal capital expenditure needs. Now, let's get into some theory with Modigliani Miller, MM, propositions. These are foundational ideas in finance that you need to know, even though the real world is a bit messier. MM Proposition 1 Without Taxes MM's first proposition in a world without taxes states that the capital structure doesn't affect the market value of a company. The reasoning is that investors can replicate the company's leverage by borrowing on their own account, so the company's mix of debt and equity doesn't change its overall value. While this is a theoretical construct, it's useful to understand that in perfect markets, the way a company finances itself wouldn't matter. Of course, in the real world, taxes and bankruptcy costs make this proposition less practical. MM Proposition 2 Without Taxes The second proposition states that as a company increases its use of debt, the cost of equity rises because debt holders have a prior claim on assets, making equity riskier. However, the overall whack remains constant in a no-tax world. Think of it like this. If Apple decided to take on more debt, its shareholders would demand a higher return to compensate for the increased risk, pushing up the cost of equity. MM propositions with taxes. When you add taxes into the equation, MM argues that the value of a company increases as it takes on more debt because interest payments are tax deductible. This means that in a world with taxes, debt can be advantageous, but only up to a point. Beyond that, the costs of financial distress start to outweigh the benefits. Many companies in the real world, like Pfizer, have used this principle to their advantage by issuing debt to fund operations and acquisitions, knowing they can benefit from the tax shield provided by interest payments. The Costs of Financial Distress While debt has its advantages, there's a dark side, financial distress. This occurs when a company struggles to meet its debt obligations, leading to potential bankruptcy. The costs associated with financial distress can be direct, like legal fees, or indirect, like loss of customers and employees. Lehman Brothers in 2008 is a textbook case. The bank's high leverage led to massive financial distress during the financial crisis, culminating in bankruptcy, the ultimate cost of financial distress. So how do companies find the sweet spot in their capital structure? According to the static trade-off theory, a company aims to balance the tax benefits of debt against the costs of financial distress. The optimal capital structure is where the company's value is maximized and WAC is minimized. But here's the kicker. Finding this exact point is incredibly tough. Most companies aim for a target capital structure that's close to this optimal point, adjusting it as market conditions and company circumstances change. Microsoft, for instance, maintains a relatively low debt level despite having a high capacity to borrow. The company's focus is on financial flexibility and maintaining a top credit rating, which is critical for their business model. Before we wrap up, let's touch on information asymmetry and signaling. These concepts are crucial in understanding how companies communicate with the market through their financing choices. Information asymmetry occurs when managers have more information about the company's prospects than investors. This can lead to agency costs, conflicts of interest between managers and shareholders. Signaling comes into play when companies make financing decisions that send messages to investors. 
For example, issuing debt might signal that management is confident in the company's future cash flows, while issuing equity could suggest they think the stock is overvalued. When Google decided to issue debt for the first time in 2011, it signaled to the market that the company was confident in its future cash flows, even though it had plenty of cash on hand. All right, let's talk about the pecking order theory, a concept that's all about how companies prioritize their financing options. Imagine you're running a company and need some cash to fund a new project. According to the pecking order theory, you're going to choose your sources of funding in a particular order, starting with the least risky and least costly option. First up, you'll use internally generated funds. That's money you've already got in the bank from profits. Why? Because it doesn't involve any new debt or equity, so there's no need to explain your decision to outsiders. If you need more funds, your next best bet is debt. It's cheaper than equity, and you don't dilute ownership. But here's the catch. Debt increases the company's financial risk, so you'll only use it if you're confident in your ability to pay it back. Finally, if you've exhausted both of these options, you'll turn to external equity, issuing new shares. This is usually a last resort because it's the most visible and sends a strong signal to the market which can affect your stock price. Think of it as borrowing from your savings first, then maybe using a credit card and only asking friends for money if you're really in a bind. Companies follow this pecking order to maintain control, minimize costs, and avoid sending negative signals to the market. So there you have it a comprehensive look at capital structure and the cost of capital. These concepts are the foundation of corporate finance, and mastering them will give you a significant edge, not just in the CFA exam, but in your financial career. Remember, the key is balance, finding that sweet spot where the benefits of debt outweigh the risks without tipping into financial distress. Make sure to practice the end of chapter questions in the CFA curriculum. And as always, think about how these theories apply in the real world. This isn't just about passing an exam. It's about understanding the financial decisions that companies make every day. Stay curious, keep practicing, and you'll be well on your way to mastering this material. Good luck, and I'll see you in the next session.